AI Game Changers podcast with Luke Whips. So, do you want to kind of take us right back then, Alex, maybe to where did your career or your professional career within software or IT begin? Like, how did all of this start for you? And what was the initial kind of point where it was a starting point? Uh, the starting point in my career for me was in the university when I was on, uh, I think, in, doing master thesis. Uh, I went to software company in, it was not far from our campus, uh, that develop, works in um, finance, finance sector. And they searched for software engineers. So I went to them, uh, talked what I'm doing, uh, explained what I want to do, uh, just talk about possibilities of how I can try to get into software engineering uh, with my mathematical background. <laughs> and uh, we found quite an interesting approach for me at that moment. It was uh, in quality assurance uh, stage. And um, yeah, that, that was the first. So I started working for them, I think, partially in the beginning because I still uh, was doing my master thesis. And then I uh, went to fully working with a company and worked with them, I think, two years uh, before before I left, it was my very first uh, experience in software engineering. When I fall in love with software engineering, <laughs> yeah. So, what? Why did you pick QA? Was it kind of the thing that was just on offer there, and that gave you the foot in the door that you needed, or was there something about release engineering and QA, generally speaking, that you found particularly attractive? Um, it was both actually. Uh, the first, it was a very good step to step into uh, software development, which I still believe is one of the best uh, steps for people who doesn't don't have any experience in software engineering uh, to get into the profession. It's uh, uh, quite quite a good place to start with, but also I never wanted to fully focus on, say, programming part, uh, where you need to think a lot about uh, how program optimization about memory about all uh, the things that you usual good software developers care uh, care about and be more on the product side but at the same time be inside uh, the software development so the qa uh, kind of balance between software development product sales whoever because they need to understand how the product works how you can test it way way it can fail how to create automated tests, how to make the quality assurance process more efficient. At the same time, understand from the product side how the product should look like, what is actually the end expected result, and what a user needs, what a business needs from it. So the person who is, as a spider, kind of sitting inside the company and looks on the all sides uh, from of the process. Mm. So do, do you feel that software engineers, if they come through kind of like a traditional... You know, I never like to speak in kind of like absolutes, but I guess in your experience, have you seen software engineers that have come from, um, you know, kind of just a traditional software engineering background, right? So internship, junior, mid-level, senior. Do you feel like they might lack the typical, um, like the sales and customer experience side of things that they might not necessarily get if they're just all about the code and just about writing the program? Do you feel like QA gave you another dimension to that engineering and that development profile that you might not necessarily get from if you just come through that kind of route one, um, route one lane? Oh, yes, absolutely. It also depends a lot uh, on the size of a company, I would say. If you're talking about startups uh, where people have to care about everything and every software developer, he needs to understand all customer needs. He sometimes needs to go to demos and be with customer on the side. Um, if you talk about bigger companies and uh, the company which where I uh, which I joined uh, was quite big, we had uh, software developers, senior software developers who were extremely good software developers regarding code and they can deliver results, but they did not know how the product is used at all. And uh, sometimes you just come to per person and say like, no, it will not work because of this, and it doesn't integrate with that solution. He's like, but I don't have any requirements that it need to be integrated with that part. But of course, it's the main goal of the product that it need mm -hmm. to be integrated and it will be part of the bigger platform. And in the big companies, when where you have the role is more like narrow, and what you do is very professional, but it is in a very low field. Like you don't often see uh, what's the bigger picture. 
um, for sure, yeah, that's uh, what, at least from my experience, that's that's what I saw there, yeah. Do you know what, dude? Honestly, I kind of, um, I really resonate with that because as a headhunter, I think aside from people just not being very good engineers, that's like, you know, why people would typically fail interview processes. Either they're just not technically strong enough or they've just mucked up in the process somewhere down to nerves or fear or whatever. I would say the second second top reason why most people fail interviews from an engineering standpoint is that they don't, they don't have that wider view on why all of this matters, either from a conceptual standpoint or from a, a customer standpoint. And I think having that kind of like boxed in view of um, their role was only this, when actually it affects so many different pieces of the puzzle. I think the real, like typically I'll see really strong feedback from engineers who have absolutely nailed it from a technical perspective but then the add-on to that is oh and they also really understood how this was going to affect the customer and this is they really understood our product and where it fit with within you know whatever whatever kind of um you know product they're trying to build they really got the bigger picture rather than just what they're trying to solve on a day-to-day um i definitely see that within um of course within interviews yeah. for sure yes for for sure uh like if you go to the role of tuner um then you probably can only know how to code and uh, it will be just a, a requirement from some moment level of seniority uh you will have a requirement to understand better what our product needs because um when you will you will be the person who will define how the product looks like uh, it's not that it will be a manager or business person or somebody like a chef who will tell how exactly the product need to be done you will define how it look like and if you want to do it efficiently, you need to understand uh, what it will be in the end and what our customers needs. In some cases, it could the answer could be that hey, we don't need a product at all. Maybe it could be done a different way. Uh, in some cases, it could be that, okay, uh, we can do it inside the house, uh, but it's just cheaper to buy it from somebody that already exists or integrate some open source solution, which is um, under license that are... that available to do us uh it's big the level of seniority at some moment that uh, you need to wait amount of time and energy that you spend or your team spends on delivering something and the actual result that you get so you need to be very you can do it only if you understand well uh what our product needs and what uh, uh in the end customers needs mm. that's for you sure know, it's um I think an interesting point on that, though, is I think that a lot of that is defined by culture because there are definitely businesses that um, I've recruited for in the past and that will typically headhunt from now where the strategy about engineering and product development is always top down. So directors tell the senior managers about what we need to build, senior managers then tell their engineers Mm -hmm. what they need to build, and then there's that kind of trickle-down engineering effect. Whereas I think the companies and organizations that get that really right are where they they have bottom-up engineering kind of embedded into their culture. And I don't think, I mean, I I think there's a lot more organizations out there like that now. Um, but I still think it's a fairly rare, rare thing to experience, especially within kind of corporate Germany and corporate or, or enterprise companies across Germany. Um you don't get a lot of progressive, agile organizations that um, really live by that bottom-up engineering mindset, right? Uh, yeah, that's, I think, why we start seeing some time ago, even from some companies where you would not expect to have it, like from automotive companies or from banks, that they have their own startups or their own agile culture uh, groups that work in the way that group defined how the product will look like. This is how I say it's rare, but it seems like business understands it. Like different companies like Carriot, uh, that was developed, opened by Volkswagen, I think a couple of years ago, they're still already quite a big company. Um, other uh, companies that were founded, um, I can't say name right now, but uh, there are a couple of also companies that, um, opened by big automotive uh divisions because I understood that it's not possible to build a good product inside in this traditional structure that you tell about. If you want to be up to speed, you have to switch to the model when engineers are capable of defining how the product will look like and they need to understand of how the product will look like um, in the end, of course. Uh, 
and they start opening the startup style uh, companies for them uh, in order to deliver results faster and better and that is modern and uh, good for sure but it also from another point of view it's uh, potentially could be chicken and egg, pro pro and egg problem so when the person with very high ambitions uh, who wants to change the world who and every engineer wants to change the world and bring his own um, view of things how the world should be developed <laughs> uh, into the company uh, he can he comes to the big organization where it's fully hierarchy with hi strong hierarchy and you have to do only what your manager says then in half a year he will or maybe a year or two i don't know he will burn out and say i don't want to go to work here anymore he will go away from this company so uh, and he will go in somewhere where this small startup culture or I can't say it's startup culture, but uh, the more culture when people are th people from engineers who have more influence is applied. He will go there and start working with people who want also to, to be uh, to have more influence on the product. Mm. Do you know, man? I've got to be honest. Whenever I see a huge corporate organization release this uh, new startup um, kind of organization that sits within the business i'm always so speculative because um although they probably work a little bit in more of an agile sense than the traditional company i just think shit is it really like that or is that just something that you want to post on linkedin because you want to get engineers that are interested in the startup culture but actually you're never going to be able to get them with the the culture that you've got right now so if we just brand it up as like this new flashy logo and we say, oh, we, we have, we've got an internal startup culture. We could potentially, we put, could potentially get that. I always think, uh, is it really like that? Or are you just, um, are you, is it just the same thing just with a different logo on it? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that intent in the beginning is true that they really want to have a different company. When we work with German automotive companies, we see that there is, because of the some tradi traditional stuff it's so hard to develop something i just just short example we need to collect the data at customer side which is a big uh, factory in the germany to do data collection we want to fly a drone around the car and just film it from different sides so that how we train our machine learning models for so we reconstruct the, fly the drone around the car reconstruct the 3d model and train with the 3d model uh, our ai we were not able to do it. <laughs> really? Uh, that's, uh, yeah, it's it, uh, because there are so many parties that like one division is the, uh, responsible for the fact that somebody is filming on the ground. Another division is responsible for there is a flying object on the ground. So the third division that is responsible for electricity that can influence because of the flying object that just was not impossible to do. And we had to bring the cars outside of the factory, find uh, find a place near the next lake and uh, do the data collection. <laughs> That's it. Or another example, our first um, project, uh, it was with Porsche uh, for um, workshop automation. And uh, to start testing on the ground, I am i can't recall now, I think it was about half a year or eight months it took to Porsche to allow self-driving cars in self-driving Porsche cars to drive inside their research and development facility just to get an allowance for that. It's like very, very slow. So I believe that initial intent for building this company is fully true because they want to simplify these processes. Mm -hmm. um, and what we start talking about is engineering having an impact, but there is also lots of different um, processes happening in background so that some stuff that you can make it faster in this modern startup culture than in traditional company, in traditional way of doing things. Uh, where if you want to switch from that one database to another, you have to get agreements of all divisions that work and it will take like a couple of months and maybe they will start doing it. And in the startup, just people can just try to do it and say, okay, it works better, we switch to it because there are no processes defined behind it. Mm. Uh, so for that, it's definitely work for, but I, it could be that at some moment, uh, because generally for me, uh, the company being startup, it's not only uh, the, if it tells that this is a startup culture, it's also the size of a company. And uh, if you have a small 20, 50 people group, uh, then it's, more boily, more, um, I don't know, more life, <laughs> lots mm. of stuff happening around and uh, it's less 
way less processes behind. But if you have a big company, at some moment you have to start defining the processes, how you work. And even a big company, it will happen at some moment that people will still have less impact as you become a bit smaller part of the bigger group. But mm-hmm. hey, uh, some people, like, I don't know, Spotify, lots of people, uh, I know some people who worked at Spotify and they were very happy doing it. They're quite a big company. I think it's 300 people. I'm, I'm not sure. No, I will, I will, maybe you can uh, say better. Yeah, uh, let me tell you, they're way bigger than 300, man. Are you talking about SoundCloud? Yeah, no, I'm talking about Spotify because uh, they released a model that I think was never applied in any other company with squads and uh, chapters uh, so that they have different groups of people who focus on product side, on new feature side, uh, but still in, even inside a big organization, they were able to organize it in a way that people were very happy of doing stuff and every everybody feels like they gave a very high impact on the uh, final product. Do you know, I read a, um, I, don't, I can't remember where I read this, um, but I read a blog or some sort of article the other day saying those chapters and the squads actually never existed in Spotify. Um, uh, yeah, I, I heard about it. Yeah, there are lots of different uh, thoughts about it. But uh, I, I think uh, it's the same as uh, talking about um, Agile uh, or, I don't know, Scrum. Everyone, uh, in, if you come to a company that says, I am Agile, you come to it and you see that there is different completely different agile from what you saw in different company. <laughs> and mm-hmm. that's uh, very different from the third company. So uh, it's maybe just set of view of you do some general things, but final implementation can be different. Uh, so this chapter says quote that they exist. Uh, the company which I, where I worked before, they tried to implement it. It worked quite uh, successfully for a couple of years. And so it was com- not same as in Spotify. We applied it to the way how we wanted to see it in our company. It worked quite well and also quite interesting because people can switch from one task to another, work for a couple of months on one project, then easily switch to new feature development, then switch again back to the project. It works was very motivational for people who uh, were inside as well. Mm. Talking so of um, like switching tasks, dude, um, I mean, one of, the, um, one of the main reasons why I wanted to bring you onto the podcast is because you are one of the successful people that have transitioned from a career in QA software engineering to something completely different into machine learning and perception, right? And that is not a trivial thing to do because whilst, as we know, there's a ton of crossover, there are also a ton of challenges to move from point A to point B. And it's not as easy as just doing, I mean, actually, maybe you disagree with me on this, but... I don't believe it's as easy as just doing a Udacity degree um, or doing something on Coursera and then overnight you're a machine learning engineer, right? So um, one of the things that I definitely wanted to speak to you about is your transition away from QA and data engineering um, into machine learning. And within the space of just under four years, you're now head of perception at a top autonomous driving startup in Berlin, right? So... That process is obviously awesome, and there will be people that will be listening to this podcast thinking, how the fuck did you do that? Um, Because that's hard, right? So, I mean, I don't know where to kind of start on that, but I guess maybe take us back to the time period where you decided that you were going to transition away from QA and software engineering, and why why perception, why ML, apart from the fact that it's very cool, what was the kind of driver for you to transition away from that? Like what, what sparked that? Yeah. So, uh, stepping back, I think that my transition start happening about, Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll need a minute to think about it. I forgot, uh, timeline, but about five years ago. Mm. Uh, yeah. So my transition started about five years ago into the field where I'm right now. So first to give a bit also background, uh, after, my uh, study in uh, master studies, I continued working in quality assurance for quite a while. I think it was about maybe eight uh, years in total, eight, eight years of working in different companies as uh, quality assurance, often with, uh, which was also combined with data engineering. Uh, it was always somehow related to machine learning because I worked a lot in the companies uh, for that do text recognition, that do um, image recognition that also perform um, 
uh, ad, uh, so, uh, the last company where I worked at uh, ad tech business and work, worked in data group uh, where we one of tasks was to predict which ad to show better to the user dependent on his uh, background views. That was always somehow related to machine learning, but uh, nothing to do with what I'm doing right now. And then um, at some moment, I and when, when I just started, uh, why I decided also to go to into software engineering in general was because in the university where I worked, uh, I, I studied, there was lots of theoretical passes, but there were no lot of practical passes. The all practical passes where you, which you can take were also somehow in very theoretical space, especially in mathematical field, you can very easy to fall into fully theoretical research. I wanted to do something practical that has impact on the life and start going into software engineering. And then when I moved to Germany uh, about um, seven years ago, uh, then I realized that actually the world is much bigger. There are lots of fields where you can apply uh, what you do. And I discovered a robotics field. I just saw it, okay, people are doing it. That's, that these jobs exists. <laughs> Why not? Uh, I was at the moment when I was not very happy with my uh, job and start looking for new applications. I saw that there are some ways to get into robotics field and then software in self-driving cars, which I, when I start digging into the top, start just falling in love with it. Uh, so that it's like, this is the future. I want to be part of the future self-driving cars development. Um, I start filing uh, the CVs and as I told, uh, 100% rejections. Um, there were also <laughs> <laughs> was a, a recruiter, um, who told that I'm extremely good candidate uh, for one QA position in a different company that has completely nothing to do with a very high salary. Um, and so like, you see, you, you can continue growing your path. You can become higher and higher and higher and uh, get more experience and get back better salary. Uh, go. It's like they open, they already have an offer for you. Go to them and say like, and don't go to self-driving cars. Like it's change of what you what you build and it will be very drop big drop into your salary so uh, don't go there and i didn't listen to him so that's why i'm here uh, now don't listen to uh, bad recruiters not, not talking about luke <laughs> uh, but, but tries to uh, tell, get you into one company and uh, that's um, it. prevent it from a dream but yeah uh, so transition started there when i started learning about uh cell driving because we can generally go to, into there and the, just fall in love i just Wanted to, wanted to do it. I said, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, first I started with Audacity course uh, that, uh, for self-driving cars. This is something very helpful if you just want to start digging into what is it, uh, what, what is it in general. And what really helped me is that at every moment when I understood it, I don't understand something, I just stopped the course and started reading about these resources. It was very hard time because during maybe half a year, uh, like, I don't remember how, for how long, but like, during quite a long time, I finished my day at 1 a.m. maybe because I wanted to understand what is it and try to learn more and more and more. For me, it was easy because lots of concepts uh, that I start learning, I already had it in university. I just didn't apply it in the way that I start understanding how exactly it could be applied into mm -hmm. machine learning, into uh, deep learning, in perception, in general development of self driving cars. Uh, in the parallel, at some moment, I discovered uh, the um, meetup in Berlin uh, that builds uh, robocars. Uh, so that was uh, the meetup um, where people build their own machines, which need to stay on the track and make uh, several loops uh, autonomously without any human intervention. Um, that I just started attending it, uh, built my own car in parallel, also getting given exp experience that I got on Audacity, also built a new experience uh, from it and um, participated in the race. Actually have one car prepared, I have one car here with this car. <laughs> <laughs> it looks, looks a bit funny. Uh, yeah, but um, uh, that uh, was able to drive uh, without a human. It was always faster, faster, faster each uh, loop until it went away because the goal was to make as fast loop as possible. Uh, yeah, and uh, after this meetup, I met uh, some people who work in the field. I started talking to them and got into into the profession, so which has got invited in the company where I work right now. It was the beginning of a project. They were searching for people who would help to build the first version of the product. So it was maybe the right person at the right time. Uh, but let's say uh, going very traditional field if I just applied to the company was extremely 
hard uh, if you because companies get lots of applications and I just get rejected on the very first uh, stage where uh, recruiters or internal recruiters or out external recruiters they say okay this person worked in great this is not exactly off the gay list uh, what I, I'm looking for I'm looking for somebody different and mm-hmm. um, often you just get rejected before I think I, yeah I, I always got rejected before the first interview mm-hmm. and never got uh, even first initial interview with a recruiter that was never happened. And the only place where I got in was just through the personal contact on the meetup when person who was my manager in the, in the next years, uh, he actually hired me because he, we discuss of my approach of how I built my self driving car. And when he mentioned that he actually posted it on LinkedIn that I was searching for people. So I reached to him and said, Oh yeah, let's, let's talk. And it was just this direct con- contact that helped me to um, get into. And that's how, but then, uh, yeah, so also the, after I got it in, was lots of information and it was definitely, let's put like this, eight hour, out, hours of work and then uh, four more hours of learning in mm-hmm. after the work because it was a lot of new information for me and, uh, that I need to process and need to get up to speed. So basically mm-hmm. the output was very high motivation that I had and lucky enough that to, to meet a person who invited Came me. Off. Very thankful for him. Yeah, um, exactly. There's, um, there's a lot to unpack there, dude, and uh, there's a lot of questions that I want to ask you, but I guess the, so the number one thing is, because I, I find it fascinating that you had hundreds of projections, right? And not a zero, like not a single interview with a recruiter, talent, another person from a organization. Why didn't you quit? I really wanted to get into the field. <laughs> mm. And uh, that was, no, uh, there was a moment when I saw that, okay, maybe it's not possible to do. There was a moment. And that was exactly the moment when uh, I got an offer of to better QA position in Munich, it was. Um, and uh, then after just thinking, after I got an offer, I just went out of for a day so that, okay, what I will do next? I will work for two years more or oh, for some time more in this field. Okay, I will get more money maybe, but I will still in the back of my mind will have an understanding that I want to go into self-driving cars. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, want to do, I want to be in this field. So just said, okay, I don't want to come in a company already thinking that I will leave with them in some moment and concentrate fully on, on it. So, yeah. Mm. What's um? Uh, I mean, what's your biggest takeaway out of that? Because so I posted on LinkedIn about this a couple of times, where I I'm very much on the side of find what you love and find what you're good at and double down on it. Um, mm-hmm. Because I think well, there's the practical sense that if you're naturally good at something, you can get better at that because you've got a natural ability that you can kind of tap into, right? And then I think there's a philosophical side to that where I'm like you're fucking going to die one day. Why are you going to spend exactly. your life doing something that you are, you kind of enjoy, but it's not exact. It's not exactly what you want to do. Right. So I think I, but then whenever I posted about it, I always get a fairly polarized piece of feedback from the community that people either really agree with me and they say, yes, double down on what you're good at. Don't give a shit about the things that you're okay at or don't really care about. And then, I, and then other people say, actually there's a real big, um, there's a benefit towards being a bit of a generalist and having loads of different touch points on things that you might not necessarily, you know, really enjoy doing, but you should spend time and effort to try and get them up to at least average. So, I mean, what's your, what's your take on that? And what's your takeaway I from completely going agree with you? you. Uh, I completely yeah. agree with you. I think that we live only once, right? Uh, mm-hmm. At one moment, unfortunately for every, people don't want to think about it, but it will end for everyone at some moment. And then the question is how you spend your life. Uh, and if you spend, uh, of course, ev- everyone has different capabilities. Sometimes you're not possible to get to the place where you would love to work or would love to, maybe you just want to be, to travel and not work at all. Maybe it will be not possible because of expenses that you have to spend. Unfortunate. Uh, so you need to find a balance. What is important to you? Uh, also, sometimes maybe related to work-life balance. For some people, it's way easier to have more uh, effort into your w- private life, into your family, into your time, what you spend outside of your work. If you have very well-defined work, which is limited in time, which you maybe don't take into account too much, you just open your laptop, you work, you get your money, you close the laptop, and then you spend your life. Uh, so you work. 
for me personally, work is a quite significant part of my life, and uh, I love to to do what I'm doing right now. I love to grow in it, and um, that's why I want to also to be in the place where uh, I do what I love. The only thing is that it's maybe sometimes it takes some some time as for me to understand what you really want to do. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so, in which field you want to be. Mm-hmm. So, how did you? Um... I mean, you probably know the question that I'm going to ask you now. Like, how did you work that out? Because that is a fairly philosophical question, right? Like, what do you want? Um, did you did it you just, process that, yes. or did did that come from the gut? Uh, no, it's a very slow process of process, and you just try. And you see, it doesn't work. Then you try again. It doesn't work. You try again. It again doesn't work. And then you start understanding why it doesn't work. Okay, maybe because you actually want this. You, Try again, and now you see that, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, um, maybe it's just my experience, but uh, at the moment when you get into the point which is yours, you will start growing extremely mm. fast. Mm. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be that you will become CTO of a company of vertical growth. It's maybe the knowledge, maybe it's community that you have. At some moment that you realize said that amount of new connections, new information, new stuff that excites you every day, it's more than you can process. <laughs> uh, so I have now a list of stuff that I will want to watch from GTC. That today is the last day of GTC, and uh, it's not given the fact that the uh, last conference is still not processing. That lots of people who I want to talk to about and share experience with. It's just growing so fast that um, at some point you realize, okay, now you're in the place where you want to be. <laughs> Mm. And in, if you just stay in the same place for some time, a couple of years, you maybe need to think about, is it yours or not? If it, it could be yours, maybe it's just a stable place that you want to be, but it could be that you just maybe in the wrong place and you're just not growing. Mm-hmm. But t- talking about the growth, because you, you were saying about you had your day job, then you would do the course and then you would finish up revision if there was particular things out of that that you didn't understand. You Some nights you'd finish up at one o'clock, right? Do you, Is that... Is that needed to be successful? Like, do, would you say that if you want to be successful, that's the kind of work that you need to be put that they need to put no, in? It, not, no, I think not. Uh, the, th- the thing is that it was needed for me. Uh, mm. I understood that I l- have lack of knowledge uh, of or have lack of experience that of some areas, and I saw that there is need for me to do. I would say you need to be capable of doing it because what we also see with people who just come the new joiners who we uh, invite in the company, the, obviously there are some areas that you don't know about. And if you want to be fast enough, uh, you have to be able to spend this time, if you don't know something, to dedicate some time in the evening to learn about it and to process it and to come next week or next days already with this background and you, better than you were before. What do you think is the difference between a good engineer and a great engineer um slightly off of this topic but i think what you're talking about is some people would look at i mean if i've heard this right so some people will look at their day job as just that kind of nine to five right where it's just like right this is like i get paid to do this i get in i do what i need to do and then i go home i think the terminology for it is quiet quitting i don't know if you've read about this i've read a tiny bit on linkedin but it's just about doing enough to get by in your career without being fired, right? But ultimately, you're doing that nine to five and that's that, right? Um, but yeah, I guess my question is, you know, what do you think makes a good engineer be a great engineer at all levels? Like, what's the common theme across good v. great engineering that you would, you would, you think? You know, I can't answer this question fully because... Inside each engineering team, uh, there are different tasks and different people. All people who I work right now with, they're all considered great engineers, everyone, but they're very different and they're very, everyone is their own field. Some people um, do better the stuff that is related to pure computer vision and mathematics, and they can deliver algorithms that you, some people, other people would never do it. Mm. Some people are better in uh, software development and engineering and can make these models that are delivered by first engineers run in production in the most efficient way. And other people 
can test it carefully and understand it how to so what makes a good engineer a great engineer maybe uh, if if you love to do it what you're doing then you will be a great engineer that's it um, because if you just do what you do you will be a good engineer but if you love what you do you will be always creative regarding the ways how it need to be processed let's put it like this what is an output what's the difference between engineer and uh, non-engineer hmm. so we uh, and that's a problem that we face often uh, right now when people from university come uh, they have lots of knowledge uh, regarding uh, related to machine learning engineers we had lots of machine learning engineers in the past and a lot of people who come they have good experience of have good knowledge of theoretical part but when it comes to engineering to programming they struggle and they don't have any experience of how to make the theoretical part to make it applied into real world mm. uh, and maybe it's lack of experience that they got in the university maybe that there is some lack of knowledge i don't know why it happens maybe that's just not this but unfortunately in the beginning when we had a bit different structured hiding process we had to um say goodbye after half a year to some people which was very painful process also for us and for them but we did so that it did not work together uh just exactly because of lack of engineering skills that people supposed to have mm-hmm. even though they were super smart and we just we were not able to teach them um and this is something that may be important so what so what is engineering is a possibility to deliver the results that works on production if you can make it if you have a task and your output of the work is something that works in the best possible way so you analyze the pro- the field you understood what possible approaches can you select what are positive and like pros and cons for each approach uh, also from engineering perspective it could be anything uh starting from how performance the approach is and then how fast is it uh so maybe it, uh it will be super accurate but super slow which is not possible for self driving cars mm. uh then you implement it and it works and you integrate it in a way that it works in a way that the next pe- person who comes after you uh he will not need to do anything <laughs> he will just use the results and it will work so mm. this is what uh, the definition of great engineer but what makes good engineer great engineer i believe it maybe love to what they do yeah do you know what i completely agree with you and i think the you're not the first person that said to me about the feedback about people straight from uni not having that the depth of knowledge of how to apply what they know in a production sense or in a commercial sense right and I've always said this, I've put a couple of posts about this on LinkedIn as well. The difference between people that I see that come straight out of university and absolutely nail their first job and people who come out of university and really struggle is direction. So what I mean by that is if you look at, um, <clears throat> I can show you these profiles of these people that are placed into junior positions, um, but all of them have one thing in common and it's having one thing in common. So they do their masters and they do their bachelors and their masters in, um, you know, machine learning, autonomous drive, whatever it might be, perception, computer vision. And you've got the kind of like application layer. Everything that they do in terms of their research is geared towards some kind of topic within computer vision, like perception, generally speaking, with a focus towards autonomous driving or drones or whatever it is. And then their internships, they go BMW, Daimler, they do some stuff at Conti, they do a work student role in an autonomous driving startup, they go to um, technical talks, they go to meetup groups outside of um, like just the normal day to day of their, their life. Um, so everything that they do is all kind of centered around what they want to achieve. And then they'll come out of uni, they'll finish their degree, they'll have all of the academic experience, but they'll also really understand how to apply that because everything that they've done has just supported that experience. Although there's still going to be growth and there's still going to be learnings for those people, right? But if you can find that one thing and really focus everything around it, like in terms of energy, that's where you fucking nail it when you come out of university. But Absolutely. the people... Uh, yeah, people who have... Uh, 
who have lots of internships, they usually are very good also regarding engineering. It also depends sometimes in the big companies when you talk about where people can uh, go into internship. Uh, there is very big definition inside big companies and small companies when they go there. In the small companies, you will more likely do engineering job because people go usually often for computer vision engineer or machine learning engineer. And, uh, sometimes when people just come from university, they forget about engineer word in this both description and they just thought it's machine learning or computer vision, but it's computer vision engineer and machine mm-hmm. learning engineer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the person who uh, engineers uh, and applies it in uh, practice. Uh, yeah, and uh, in some big companies, there are some still uh, research uh, groups and you can get as intern inside the research group which often also is similar to what you experience in the university. Uh, so what I mean this in the university, and this is very often for universities and general research and development process in, mach- in mathematics and machine learning. Uh, when you do a lot, try different lots of tries, you spend some time on it, you see some results, but then you understand that these results are not applicable to the work. So you turn 980 degrees, you cut everything, all the job that you did in half a year, and you start trying something different. You start trying more and more and more and more. So you, there are lots of tries, which big companies like Google or uh, Facebook can they can do it inside because they have lots of resources for that. So they can have groups and also interns in these groups that can work in fully theoretical field without any practical application. But there are also companies, and we see it a lot of people who were inter- made internships in. Uh, I don't know, in Continental, <laughs> in uh, other groups, uh, they often come with uh, good uh, engineering perspective. At least they don't struggle with some problems that... I, I don't know what it, what's about Git, but uh, this is one of big problems which people who don't have any experience and just come from the university, they don't how to know how to use it. This is one of basic stuff that you everyone need to do, understand what what's concepts behind it. <laughs> but mm. yeah. What um I I'm just conscious of time a little bit because we're we're really diving into this topic partic- in particular. But I mean, so what are the what are the things that you see people fail on like all the time? What are the common denominator? Like you've just mentioned Git there, right? So if you were like Luke, people are always shit at this, or usually when they come straight out of uni or they're transitioning mm-hmm. away from or they're trying to transition away from another part of engineering. What are people most like most likely fail at? I would say it's more collaborative work. Uh, so the Git was also an example of collaboration work. Uh, the engineering work is always when you interact with another people. It can be that part of your code is used for by another person later. It can be changed by another person later. And the biggest problem is to output, to deliver the code that is readable, that is understandable, that it has good comments, and um, that can be later integrated by somebody who just f- see the code first time. This is the most uh, important part, um, I would say. Just on that, Alex, like what, like for me, I'm, obviously I'm not an engineer, right? But for me, that sounds like pretty simple stuff um, or it should be fairly simplistic. So paradoxically, like what do you see as not well-written code or well-documented code? Like how does that actually look? I know it might be quite difficult to describe but in a paradox what are you seeing as like oh that's just not what we want it's i would say basically when you that that's a good question so when you open the code you can already see if it is well thought or not well thought uh if i start dropping it down into particular examples it will start looking very easily because i can say like that's uh functions names uh not in the style of the code that you do uh, for example, you use uh, Java type type of um, naming variables in the Python code, or other way around. It, uh, it could be, or you start doing I don't know, <laughs> uh, uh, not com- leaving any comments at all, making two time space. This is something that's simple that can be changed quite fast. Uh, but the problem is it's a bit more complicated and regarding experience that you get. Uh, so you can obviously tell the person, please write your code, structure your code like this. Um, but the person will not understand why, why it is important. Mm-hmm. And he will fail into some other places where it's obvious that it's need to be done in this way uh, if you deliver the code that is part of the another code. But... Um, he will he will still be in very much learning phase. What we uh, experienced 
and uh, that people who has some people just very hard to learn this development paradigms mm. even if they're very smart regarding machine learning say if, if we talk about our group in particular they had to learn how to uh, write the code that can be good that is a good code at the same time when people who has very good uh, experience in software development they come uh, and they can output very high high quality code they can work with very complicated systems if you say to the person hey uh, can you uh, make uh, implement this uh, the post processing for this neural network in the triton which he first first time see this neural network he first time know what's the triton he said it's kind of it's at the same time easy but it's super complicated things we don't come into details uh the co- complicated system so you need to know lots of details he can start digging into it understand it what how it is built how it's engineer, engineered and how exactly to write the spot so it will work particular in this field so they can do it but they don't know some of computer vision mm-hmm. the things from but the, uh, they have background in it but they don't know it and they can learn it in a couple of days or okay weeks but they can learn it but learn how to be a good developer is almost impossible in a short time you need to have experience with it uh, so you it's hard to drop down into small exactly examples of doing it. Mm. Yeah. And I guess that's probably not taught in the current curriculum from an academic perspective, right? Because they're not assessing that. I mean, the theoretical um, understanding that people have is what they're basing the grade grades on, right? Um, I mean, they're not going through program. Um, it's hard to judge. Uh, we currently work, have some projects with a university in Braunschweig, uh, which has... Ex- uh, I would love to learn one more time to study in this university, probably, because they have very interesting application of what um, what they do, what they learn. They have all their own self-driving cars that they drive in their test grounds, and uh, students can work on this parts and uh, work on the code. So... I believe there are lots of uni- good universities that actually do have this part. Um, but uh, what makes them successful is that I know that there are lots of collaborations with uh, real companies and German automakers. So it's not, they don't work in fully isolation from what is, uh, industry needs. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that's, uh, if you go into the university and in the group inside the university that is somehow connected to the industry and that deliver results to any company that work in the industry, then um, it's um, there is a high probability that processes are quite well defined. But uh, mm. for sure, there could be lots of universities that are just pure theoretical. Mm. I think the one thing that we didn't touch on as well within all of that space is the Formula One teams that they put together. So um, you've probably seen like the Indy races and stuff, right? And the guys yes. who won the Tum Indy race, um, I think it was last year, they founded drive blocks off of the back of that. Yes, yes. Um, and I think and this is what I, I was want, saying I want, I want about, to see them on IE in this uh, weekend. I'm going to IE on the weekend. I want to see them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, it, I mean, if you Alex was on the podcast, right? So if you want me, if you don't know him, I'll introduce you. But anyway, um, so, yeah, I mean... This is another point about wrapping up your experience within like a common thread. Because if you do your internships at BMW and Conti and whatever, you do your external projects and your external learning all really centralized around autonomous drive or whatever it might be that you want to do. And then you're involved in university projects like the Formula One teams and all of that sort of stuff. Um, what is it called? I think it's Tum Fast for... Um, for um too far sorry for uh for tum but um yeah if you have all of these it's like as you said earlier it's like having a bit of a spider diagram about you're centralized in the middle and then where people fail is they go okay cool i'm going to learn about machine learning i'm going to learn a little bit about reinforcement learning i'm going to learn a little bit about python and i'm going to learn a little bit about this i mean you then just become average right and you just become pretty you learn you know a little bit about everything but it's what you've got no direction when you're like right what's going to make me really successful within these kinds of roles what do i really need to know um then you 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 kind of list them out and then you double down into that plus you just support that with tons of experience across all of those things 
I think that's what's ma- what makes people really successful and what really sets people up for amazing careers. Or like you, you utilize the skills that you've got and then you think, right, what do I want to learn? What do I need to do to get there? And then you just put the graft in because I could almost, I think a lot of people like the idea of transitioning away from what they do. And then they will look at something like machine learning or autonomous driving. Oh, I'd love to do that. But how many people are willing to stay up until one in the morning learning shit that they don't know and putting in the graph before they get that opportunity? Like a lot of people that I speak to, no, obviously you're not one of them, but a lot of people that I speak to are, they're really keen to transition, but they want the company to give them the opportunity to do that. So they don't want to mm-hmm. change. They just want to join another company and then they'll learn on the job and they'll be developed by that organization. And I, I, I think that's unfair. Um, I think that's unfair on companies to, uh, sorry, I think that's unfair on people that their expectation is that the company should train and develop me. I mean, why yeah. should they? I think that um, my general belief is that the most, um, the biggest jumps that you do in your career in general, not maybe not only in the career and everything, is when you put yourself out of comfort zone. If you are in a comfort zone, the your de- personal development is very slow, and unless you really are in your field and you really want to progress inside your in the field where you want to continue growing, but generally, if you're in the comfort zone, then it's less of <laughs> uh, so it's it's not um, as as effect- effective as if you go outside. Like, Imagine if you lose the job tomorrow, then you start learning lots of stuff that can make you better and then can maybe potentially can uh, get you a better job. Obviously, it's an extreme scenario, but um, also the people, when they change a job, they often get higher <laughs> salary, mm. uh, which potentially could be just because you start thinking about it. You start thinking what what you do, start learning some things during this uh, hiring process, which can bring you some knowledge but mm. also from to the first point i believe that uh the place where you just learn everything a bit it's uh, quite a good start also to you to understand what you like most like if you want to work on if you talk about uh, autonomous cars if you mm. um want to work more on the car side and to work, work more on the controller side this you is can't exactly finish the place that. where you want to that's not that's not the end game though right like you're right that's a brilliant starting point to be like right you know, let's try a bit of everything and then let's see mm-hmm. what tastes the nicest. Yeah. But then, but then you need to double down. That's when the work starts, yes. right? So it's, it's kind of, yeah, uh, it's, uh, two things. First, you need this minimum. Even if you work as computer vision engineer, you need to understand what is IMU. So what is like, what is, uh, how the actuators work? You need to understand, uh, how trajectory planning is going on. So all the stuff that you probably never touch as computer vision engineer, uh, you still need to understand all the basis. But at the same time, maybe from some level, you don't need it. So it's quite important to have the basis to understand all around. But from some moment, you need to develop into one field which you talk, talk about. So only in one specific and focusing on it here. Mm. Um, I feel like we've gone on to like a career uh, career advisory uh, podcast, but... <laughs> well, um, why not? <laughs> yeah, Maybe yeah. it will be helpful for someone here. Well, honestly, dude, like I think this is one of the main reasons why I wanted to start the podcast is because I think everyone's got their own little, um, you know, like their own little touches of experience that they can really share with people. And if one person listens to this podcast and they think, actually, this is how Alex did it, I'm going to, I'm going to follow suit and I'm going to grind and they, they do it as well. I think it's worthwhile doing. So, um, for me, I think it's always, um, it's always a good thing, but, um, if just if somebody from your listeners will, it will help to somebody to get into a field that they love. I will buy, buy some coffee. I will be yeah. more than happy to help. <laughs> <laughs> good. Just man. reach me. Find yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> I will do yeah. It. <laughs> Good, man. Um, all right. Well, look, let's, um, I mean, the other thing that I wanted to kind of touch on with you is obviously kind of like the future of autonomous drive. I know we've not got a ton of time left. So, I mean, maybe we could do this in a fairly succinct way, but, um, I mean, what's the, what, what are the roads, skies, train systems, buses? What's our, um, what's our world going to look like in three years when it comes down to travel? Um, that's a good point. Um, 
So autonomous vehicles, they have different applications. Uh, one of that people always have in mind, they talk about its personal cars. Mm. Maybe it will be not here yet. Uh, at some degree, I can um, unco- un- unwrap it a bit. Um, but uh, for personal cars, maybe it will be less. My hope is that we will see uh, lots of people movers, uh, like small vans that can deliver you from point A to point B, which I think already happened in some areas, like in Berlin, in the hospital, there are some self-driving small, say, even though you can call it a bus, like that fits mm. in like eight people and that it can drive you around the campus there. Um, self-driving trains, um, everything that is on the rails definitely can go. In uh, Copenhagen, there are already self-driving metro. Uh, so there's not subway, it's like Ober, uh, I'm sure how to correct, uh, tell like S-Bahn for, Germ- mm. for German speaker. <laughs> because it's already navigated uh, autonomously, which is cool. Um, and um, some automation of factories uh, and uh, deliveries, uh, delivery trucks, uh, it, it can happen. Mm. So do you feel like we're going to get to a stage whereby... I mean, this is way too far in the future to predict anything like this, but do you feel like eventually we're going to get to a stage whereby everything is autonomous and we're just part of a wider transport system that's kind of, as you say, a bit just like an autonomous um, system that's interconnected and there are no such things as personal cars anymore or personal transport. It's just like you're part of a system that moves autonomously, be that in a singular basis, i.e. a car, um, or as part of a network like on trams, buses, that kind of stuff? We may, to some degree. Why not? Mm. We may. Uh, yeah, I would always love to get in my car in Potsdam, uh, set destination to Alps, sleep eight hours, and then in the morning I'm <laughs> on the beautiful lake uh, somewhere in the Alps. Why not? Um, mm. Yeah. Uh, if it happens in the nearest future, I don't know. Uh, it's a l- long, long, long way. And uh, it's definitely in the beginning of it, we shouldn't expect anything extremely fast there. So the probably one of the problems of uh, autonomous driving, which uh, also happens during last 20 years, that technologies progress so fast. Like you mentioned, what was, what, what was your phone 20 years ago? I had the button phone. And it was like, I remember there was a 3G launched. And everyone's like, wow, that's, we don't have any 2G anymore. We oh, have 3G. It's amazing. <laughs> it's so f- freaking fast. Yes, now when I get back to 3G, I don't understand there is no speed at all. I, there was a moment when I saw that 3G is just like a, a rocket mm. fast. And the, the progress so fast uh, that people put in expectations to some new technologies that, okay, I hear today about self-driving uh, trucks. Why tomorrow? Why I don't have them yet? Mm. Because it's not as easy <laughs> as you think about it. Maybe in 20 years from here, the technology will be so nailed down that we work out with all edge cases. We figure out how to do everything in simulation to simulate all the possible scenarios that we face on the road. That, And uh, from government side, we also get uh, full allowance to drive cars that every, everything will come autonomous. Mm. It could be. But uh, so far, it will just... What we see, like, is very, very small individuals. So we don't should, definitely shouldn't expect it in three years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that was probably the biggest question, you know, is, like, what's stopping us from getting there right now? Because I think, I don't know if you agree with this, but we've got the technology, right? Um, I mean, as you said, there's ed- there's always going to be tons of educators and um, outliers that will probably catch out a lot of autonomous systems, generally speaking. But um, generally speaking, I think we're kind of there. So... What's the kind of hold now? Do you feel like it's a trust thing with the general population? Do you feel like it's a government thing in terms of like legislation and it like, or is it an infrastructure thing from a, um, I don't know what the word would be, just like a general infrastructure from a um, like a country standpoint? What what do you think is kind of holding us back from deploying autonomous driving cars at scale right now? Uh, currently. So it's uh, everything what you do in maybe most of uh, software engineering. It's very easy to do first 90, 95, 99, whatever percent of your stack. Uh, if you start building your self-driving car today, uh, you will download the libraries, uh, you will build your, maybe you can hack your can on the, your car. 
you can build a self-driving car in quite a short time and maybe even from already available resources from internet you can download it like to build a small robot currently like that i had showed before it, it will take you like a day maybe to assemble it and it will drive on the track autonomously already mm-hmm. but then there is this five one five percent left of scenarios that are very complicated and that are uh, not in your data set probably because they represent some extreme situations uh, that are, you need to try to figure out how to deal with them and to get to them it takes much more time just to give an example from for us we have a bit different uh, case of cell driving because we have uh, geofenced areas which we, where we drive it's not public roads uh, it's usually uh, it's, it could be public parking lots but it's usually geofenced area and the very first project which we got the localization of a car was about half a meter from even if not more so it's like quite far away from the reality to build this first version of uh, the system it took us a couple of months to have it then it took us a year maybe to get it from 50 to 20 mm-hmm. centimeters and then it took us three more years that like we're now rolling out a new version which is like five centimeters so it's always like more and more and more that's just about localization about one small part um then uh, if we talk about scenarios that happen on the road it's still uh, very complicated what i can't uh, but it's also at the same time it's regulations sometimes regulations pre- uh, requires some insane stuff that happens in extremely 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 rare but we still need to account for them. For example, for us, we cannot start a car. Uh, there is like ISO requirement. We cannot start a car if there is a child uh, half under the vehicle because potentially it could be that the child dropped down the ball and he got under the vehicle and we should not start moving it. I fully understand this is a super valid case. We need to work with it. The probability of this case, maybe it never happened in last year in the entire country that some child uh, start doing it it will not happen in in Mm -hmm. any situation that we face right now and it also comes to general trust so also the third part that you have general trust of the system um what we see from at least from publicly what tells uh, waymo and other companies that have lots of uh miles driving in us already autonomously fully without any human supervision that uh, the cars are safe. They are sometimes over safe. So Mm -hmm. they sometimes stop in a case when uh, you should not stop as a human, you will probably avoid it. They are safe. They sometimes fail, but they fail in often in the situations when human does not fail. So, Mm -hmm. and this is the hardest uh, stuff to take to as, as, as us as a human, that even if you like say on a thousand miles of driven uh the human average uh, it's just made up the numbers but hu- human average will make 10 accidents uh because of different uh, reasons he's distracted by kids sitting on behind he's tired or maybe it's dark and there is complicated situation and maybe there are lots of cars around and he can just can't look on the all sides simultaneously uh there could be different stuff where the self-driving car will never fail and it will be like the because a, a self driving car will just fail in 1%, there will be one accident, not 10, on the same amount of miles, or even less, maybe like 100 times less than human. But it will fail in the situation when human will never fail, because mm. human perception and uh, machine percep- perception are completely different. Uh, and it will fail in situation when people will never fail. And then when it happens, also because it's a new technology, everyone says, okay, you see, the, cell, the Tesla hit the huge trunk that was like standing on the... Why did not see it? It's like huge. Yes, for you, it's as a human, it's huge. But for because cars see the world differently and any mm-hmm. robots see the world differently, um, it, it's um, they may fail in this situation. The thing is that the, in general, percentage of failure will be way lower. And that's mm-hmm. hard to take, but they will fail, obviously, in the situation where he will never do. At the same time, we'll never, like, there was these videos on, of Tesla's uh, stopping down when, even before the accident happened, because uh, it already predicted, because of different cars moving, um, uh, there, there will there is dangerous situation. Or a wild boar jumping around in the night on the street, that where you, I would even not notice it, I would just the, I replay the video that it's on YouTube, seven, like maybe 10 times before I understood what's happened actually, why the car did this left, like there was like a 
hard left and then hard right turn mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I was a wild boat in the night. I just jump like maybe 20 meters in front of a car. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And imagine if you just got distracted for a second, then you, at this moment. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I guess the, um, do you know the thing that I always find quite interesting to think about is the, um, maybe the, the legislation and the, um, maybe this is a bit philosophical as well, but, um, so if cars are, I don't know what the um, safety rating of, like the safety percentage of cars are, generally speaking, and like human drivers, let's say it's like, I don't know, 80, 80% or something like that. Even if autonomous cars were at 82%, that would make a quite drastic difference on the overall death percent, uh, percentage globally, right? For like um, accidents and stuff like that. So do you feel like, autonomous vehicles have got an everlasting battle of regulation and legislation because if it's probably never going to get to 100%, right? And as you say, there are always going to be these outliers where it's like, well, why the fuck didn't it see that plane or why didn't it see that, yep. you know, whatever. Um, but surely just from a purely objective standpoint, even if it's 1% better, it's 1% better. Um, so do, do we know... Or well, what's your take on where that kind of cutoff point is where government um, organisations would actually get behind something like autonomous driving purely from a safety perspective? Um, or do you feel like there's not really that number and they're looking for the 100%? I think there is no number, but it will come. Uh, the thing is that uh, self-driving cars are happening already partially in the cars. All mm. uh, ADAS features uh, that we see in the cars, they are taken from self-driving world. Right, so the situation when you can follow the car in front of you, or like for safety, if you can predict a break or if you can predict there is a object that is dangerous and car can break by itself, even if the human is not breaking, this all features are taken from self-driving cars and they're slowly ingesting into the cars that are currently on the roads. Um, and yeah, that's uh, where government will probably see like slowly that these features work and the f- amount of features will be increased. Uh, these features also work, then amount of features will be increased. And again, again, uh, it's the first about the features, second about um, geofencing. Uh, say driving on autobahn is a pretty much simple task for any self-driving car. So, uh, because you just follow the line, you can change the line. There is not a lot of happening on the autobahn that like on the, which on the highway that you can, um, face. And, uh, the, that's where also students start learning on the, uh, on, on the data from highways, uh, because it's way easy to program. And if people start alone in this area and we start doing it, then government will also see. So the key point here is to be more incremental. Uh, and not try to deliver all at once that maybe some companies are aimed to do. Uh, maybe that's a good way to raise money, but it's not very good to show government, show other people that that's uh, that the cars are safe and they are very useful. So uh, it should be incremental stuff. Uh, but also one stop, one point I, I didn't uh, to also reply to your previous question um, is uh, the cost of the car. Mm-hmm. Uh, currently, uh, so what Tesla did, uh, they wanted to, they understood that uh, the cost of a car with all bunch of sensors, like with LiDAR, with radars, uh, with all the rest, it will be, it will double uh, the price of a, of the vehicle uh, just because of sensor price of all this processing power. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, that's not what people would want to have. <laughs> and obviously the cars like Waymo, they also look funny sometimes, but okay, no, Waymo look very nice, but some self-driving cars, uh, they look very funny with all bunch of things on the top that they have on the sides, uh, which probably end consumer would not always buy. They want to buy more nicer things. And why you should pay two times more? New Q5, man. No way. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not. That's, yeah. Uh, why you should buy for it and have like a bit ugly looking car. And at the same time, oh yeah, it has some of the right features. So it's also a task to make um, it with less sensors or make it cheaper, make it look nicer. Uh, and for this, uh, this is also kind of a complicated stuff to make <laughs> uh, for all self-driving uh, cars to do. Yeah. Mm. But you're... That's why we also, yeah, sorry, uh, that's why we also uh, talk about uh, B2B business uh, when people don't care much about how the vehicle looks like and we can actually pitch 
pick it up with all type of sensor, but it will be uh, already self-driving in some area for business. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I think realistically in the future, it's probably going to be a lot more of a kind of B2B application than B2C, right? Um, I mean, as you say, the, so I've got the new Q5, um, the, the new Audi Q5, and that's got... Um, um, Adaptive cruise control. So I think on, I mean, that's, what, is that level three autonomy anyway, right? If it's just one lane or level two? Uh, so it's more about responsibility. Uh, mm. So it can be any area that you talk about, but this is a moment when uh, the car drives, not you drive. So there are like five level of autonomy. And the first two is where, the first is when there is no autonomy. Second, there is like some, it does features. A third one is actually where the car is, so the way there is no human responsibility, there's like more car responsibility, but it is very limited. It could be any limitation. So it could be only sunny day, not mm-hmm. no rainy condition. It could be only particular part of a highway and not any other place. It could be some limitations that uh, you, that they, the developers that produce, uh, people who produce the car, they define it, but they tell that in this place, the car will drive you. And it has a responsibility, but it will alert you if something happened and you need to have a possibility to take over and uh, to drive. Mm. So that's uh, the regulation. And I think what's, this is what uh, the Mercedes, they launched in May. And they got permission to drive till 60 km per hour, if I'm not mistaken, in some limited conditions. Also, line following, if I'm mistaken, maybe on Autobahn. I can't imagine driving somebody 60 on German Autobahn but it's too slow for it uh, but uh, yeah that's what they slowly step that they start doing here yeah, the first I think that's the first in Germany any anything above two level two mm-hmm. yeah I've got some um, as I said I've got some ADAS features in the the Q5 which are really awesome but um, yeah I mean some of them kick in a way to do you know what actually so when I was first um when I first got the Q5, I was driving it home. It was literally like the second day I got it or something like that. And um, uh, do you know when you just kind of slightly take take your eyes off the road for a little bit, but then you don't realise that it stands still traffic on the motorway. That comes up super quick, right? Like you, you take your eyes off the road for a second or two, and then you're all instantly there and then you have to slam the brakes on. I remember the first time I was driving it back. And this was the first time I was like, thank God I had that because it was just a crazy experience. And I didn't even know I had this as a functionality in the car. Mm-hmm. But I was driving and that happened. And the car like shook it. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but it was, um, it kind of vibrated the entire car. Mm-hmm. It, I think it breaks really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I was like, shit, like that's the first real life ADAS experience I've had where I was like, that is incredible. Um, I would imagine it was just measuring the, the red light meters to the red light or something like that, right? But um, yeah, it was incredible. Um, I'm looking forward to it, man. I hope that one day we do get, I mean, I'm super excited about the future, generally speaking. I think it's going to be incredible. And yeah. I think in the next 20 years, um, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be amazing, man. But you sound positive cool. about the uh, the automotive industry, generally speaking. Yeah, I'm pretty much positive. Also, what what you're talking about, so and what I mentioned that sometimes car currently they're over safe. Yes, obviously there are some situations also like with recent uh, Tesla tests uh, hitting a child, which is like was dummy, like where they put uh, the dummy of a child that Tesla hit it constantly for some reason. Uh, <laughs> there will be some. That's a bit scary situation, obviously, of course. But it's uh, again back to what um, I told before. There are some scenarios which are. Person would never probably do, mm. uh, but uh, there are sometimes it's over safe. And uh, what I read a lot of people who try to drive in Weimar, they sometimes just stop in front of road construction and they wait for fifteen minutes until the remote driver can jump in. And that's uh, what potentially could happen: is that we have partially uh, self-driving systems when which drive around, but then if it is struggle, then the remote driver kicks in. Mm. That's why there are lots of startups uh, who develop uh, remote driving technology. Uh, then, uh, that, Vey, yeah. Vey, yeah. Vey's business but, model is that, right? So I don't think it's... They, 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 they sit tourism. next to us in Drivery. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, we're in the same place, yeah. That's an uh, amazing company. That's They uh, do already drive. So I think that what's the first project that they will do is in Hamburg, like pub- public project, when they deliver the um, uh, sharing, car sharing mm. to you. So you order car share and the car drives with a remote driver to you to the place where you want it and then you sit and you drive it to where 
decide. And they, yeah. uh, I believe they also have lots of um, autonomous driving features as well that helps uh, human, that the human still drives, but there are lots of features that helps him to uh, analyze the world and what's happening around. So some parallel system that can tell them always, this is like, no, that is not safe to drive because you didn't see that as a red light or something. So mm. it's maybe to 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 parallel the system human and some uh, autonomous driving uh, system in parallel. Awesome, man. I think it's a. Uh, I think they have got a good business model there. To be honest, yeah, um, it is. But, um, it is. It, it will be very sustainable in the future. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to see, man. We'll have to see. Um, but dude, we're uh, we're way over time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're at one hour twenty, man. So um, yeah, I mean. Look, just as a wrap up, um, Alex, firstly, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, dude. And um, yeah, sharing your thoughts about everything is uh, super valuable. So thank you so much, man. And um, yeah, it was an absolute pleasure to to have you on the show, dude. Okay. Also, it was very pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> I love to talk about the things and I'm happy to talk to you today. Awesome, man. 